In today's video, I will be covering all the differences between old and modern day Deep Woken, including some I bet lots of you watching this don't know about or didn't really know about in detail. Make sure to subscribe since only about 20% of the people watching this video right now are actually subscribed. And now let's get into it. First of all, let's talk about the original mantra creation system. I've talked a lot about this with Agamatsu, so I have a pretty good idea about how it works. In modern day Deep Woken, you get mantras when you level up and get them from card pulls like talents. In the old days of pre-release Deep Woken, in order to get mantras, you had to find and cores. Cores were items that would let you create and modify your mantras. Basically, if you were a Gale user, you would have to start with a Gale core as the base of your mantra, and there were cores for every type of mantra and every attunement. You would also likely have to trade cores with players if you didn't have the attunement for the core that you did have, and if they had an attunement core that they did not have. Anyway, after getting a core, you would need core modifiers such as a ranged mantra core modifier or a melee mantra core modifier. If you were to put a Gale core with a ranged mantra core, you would probably end up with something like Gale Gun. If you were to add some something like a flame and a melee core, you would probably get something like flame blade. Then there were other modifiers like the ones in Deep Woken now, which would add stuff like AoE to your moves. So an AoE ranged Gale mantra would probably just give you the original tornado mantra. This system sounds cool, but a lot of testers apparently hated it because it made getting mantras super tedious and RNG based, because you weren't guaranteed to get the right cores for the mantras that you wanted. I think it would actually be cool if they brought this back with some tweaks, like making certain missions that would guarantee you at least cores of the same attunement that you have, or maybe a mission that would guarantee that you get a core for a type. So you can have one mission that would give you Gale cores, one mission that would give you range cores, one mission that would give you AoE cores or melee cores as well. And that would actually be pretty cool because it would make it more unique than the current way that you have to get talents. I also think it would be cool if you could maybe combine mantra cores because then if they did that it would be possible for us to have mixed hybrid attunement mantras. So you could have like a flame blade with the power of gale aftercut on it or something like that. It would also just be really cool if you could combine attunements into singular mantras. This would have been cool but of course the mantra creation system is no longer in deep woken so we're never really going to get to see what that would have been like in its full potential, which is really upsetting, but whatever. Along with mantras, there also used to be a skill tree for talents. The skill tree would just let you choose talents from each of the stats that you had. So if you put points into agility, you would level up and then get to put a point into a talent, and with the branches being related to different paths such as ghost or butterfly. Now it's just done through the card draws, and honestly I have no idea why they removed this skill tree. They made so many updates to stop talent RNG like removing luck and adding card burns and freezes and the boon for scrapper, and they did all of this to stop RNG when they could have just reintroduced the skill tree removing talent RNG and making it easier to get what you want because everyone's just going to be min-maxing their build until they get what they want anyway. And then they could have just made it so if you wanted, if they wanted to keep the talent requirements hidden, you could only see the talent once you've met the requirements, so you can't tell exactly what the requirements were. This also wouldn't have made Shrine of Order any worse, because they could have just made it so it would let you respect points and get your talent points back while keeping the talents that you've already obtained. And you also used to have to choose your talents at a campfire, instead of just anywhere with a UI pop-up with the thing at the top, like it is now. I also want to talk about a lot of the PvP changes. First of all, parrying. In testing, they made it so holding F would put your guard up for a block. Clicking M1 with your guard up would let you parry. I'm not sure if it's because of me, but I did actually make a video saying to change parrying to what it is now. And first of all, when I made that video, a ton of people told me it was a bad idea and I was wrong. Which, to everyone that said that, you're dumb and I'm right, and I always knew it would be better in the current system than it was with the old system, but because I'm not a developer, people would just assume that I'm wrong. Until, you know, the developers actually had a similar thought to me, agreed with me, and implemented the change that I thought was a good idea. I'm not gonna lie though, I do think bringing back F plus M1 for pairing would be a lot better for new Deep Woken, because in the current state of the game, playing Chime of Conflict and ending up in a 5 minute long parry trade while the other person is sitting out the most massive world ending nuclear mantras I've ever seen isn't really the most fun to me anymore. So I think F plus M1 pairing shouldn't be brought back because it would change the game drastically, but if it were brought back it would kind of bring back me to the game because even though I actually don't like F plus M1 pairing that much, it would make it just a little bit more fun because then I don't have to worry about, you know, infinite parry trades as much anymore and then getting hit by the most fucking, like, world-ending devastating mantra I've ever seen in my entire life. Along with parrying, venting also changed a lot. Venting was originally a mechanic added to dodge spells. Holding G would start venting, which would rapidly drain ether, but during, oh, sorry, ether, anyway, 
but during the vent, you couldn't be hit by magic-based mantras. Now, venting is a tool added to escape combos or extend them, depending on your erudition stat, but dodging did not have iframes at all during Deep Wilkins testing, so you weren't supposed to use that in order to dodge mantras unless you could get out of the range of the mantra. Dodging was really just a completely evasive tool because it didn't have any sort of iframes. And also, in comparison to Verse 2, there's a whole lot of differences, especially between venting, which is now literally just escape combo for free or extend combo for free. When before, it was literally just you're invincible for as long as you hold the G button and you're not already in a stun. Anyway, between Verse 2, there's a whole lot of differences. First of all, the delay between parrying after missing a parry is super long now. It's almost a second long, which means you're super easily punished if you are to miss a parry. Second of all, uppercuts, which now exist as a way to counter aerial attacks and start aerial combos, which honestly, I really don't like uppercutting. It's not that good. In any situation where you could uppercut, there's probably a better option to do it. Uppercutting really only exists to counter aerial attacks because let's say you hit someone with an uppercut, you could have literally just hit them with an attack because it doesn't matter that you're going to bring them up into the air. The second hit is always super easy to a parry, so you're probably just gonna get reset anyway. So uppercutting really has no reason to exist other than to counter aerials because every other use for it is completely garbage. Also, in comparison to pre-release, the posture system has changed a lot. First of all, there's way less posture in the game now than there was in testing, meaning guard breaks happen a lot more. And second of all, posture regeneration has also changed similarly in how the difference between now and then was you used to have to hold F and your posture would regenerate, kind of like in Sekiro, but now if you're holding F, your posture won't regenerate, so it's the opposite now. And also, ragdolls were super common in pre-release. We can see a ton of mantras that ragdoll people, and we can see people getting hit while ragdolled, versus now where getting ragdolled usually gives you invincibility frames, and there aren't even a lot of mantras that straight up ragdoll you. I don't think there are any mantras that straight up ragdoll you in current day Deepwoken. However, back then there were a lot of mantras made specifically to ragdoll you and leave you open for combos. Next up is the progression. Deepwoken originally had more linear progression based on quests, in which obtaining EXP and gear was done by doing quests like the original shipment mission. Now, a lot of testers don't like the shipment mission, but I don't think that's because the mission was bad. The shipment mission was really well executed and really well done. It is, in my opinion, a near-perfect beginner mission, which would introduce lots of the video game concepts like stealth, fighting humanoid NPCs in a PvE environment, looting, and sailing mechanics to the player when they were first supposed to start playing the game. The only reason why I think testers didn't like it was because it was repetitive, but that isn't the fault of the mission, that's the fault of the developers. Since the shipment mission was the only mission in the game, a lot of testers hated it because it was too repetitive and boring after the first few times that you did it, since there's really only two routes you can take for that mission, which is either stealth or just going in there and killing everyone. But after testing, the devs really didn't implement any other quests because they had already decided against quest-based progression in exchange for non-linear progression, where you would fight monsters for EXP. And I think that they did this because it was just easier. I don't think the progression is any less linear. I think if anything, it's more linear because the same route is going to just be the same thing every time for progressing to kill monsters but it's easier to just add monster spawn zone and then tell the players they have to kill the monsters spawning in the same spot every time than adding a new quest every single level for the player if the game had more quests then quest-based progression would have been amazing and actually i think it would have been way better than the game's current progression as they could have implemented lore and world building into the quests and maybe as people complete these quests we could see the world around us change because deep Oaken really hasn't undergone any change in the last 600 years but then again it's easier to just make monster spawn areas so that's what the devs chose to do making the only quest in the game at the time repetitive and in an attempt to make the progression non-linear they accidentally made it even more linear because the progression route is the same every time with you going to erisia then hive then whatever your boss fight of choice is, usually Chaser, until you're max level with Bell. A lot of the islands in the game have also changed. What is now known as Geoduck Cove is actually not in the game anymore. A lot of you might have remembered Geoduck Cove if you're an OG player as a super important island that many testers talked about during testing that looked like the image on screen now. Very nice shape. This was a secret island known to harbor a secret boss fight known as the God's Breath in which you would have to fight against a drowned god. And to this day, nobody knows if it was ever possible to beat that boss, or if he'll ever even come back to Deepwoken. 
I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Make sure to subscribe since only about 20% of the people watching this video right now are actually subscribed. I stream on Twitch pretty much every single day at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, so you can always drop in and see if I'm streaming at those times. I hope you all have a great day. Goodbye, and I love you all.